Chapter 4 The American Home From Dark and Isolated to Bright and Networked During the last two decades of the 19th century, business executives, city leaders, and engineers in many parts of the world began to direct installation of trolley, water, sewer, and telephone, as well as gas and electric networks. Rose, 1995, page 2 Introduction Housing Unlike the slow, incremental 1870 to 1940 advance of food and clothing examined in the last chapter, the changes in household shelter and its equipment treated in this chapter were revolutionary. American farmers replaced primitive farmhouses, including the mud huts and log cabins of the frontier, with more solid and substantial farm dwellings. Urban apartment dwellers moved from fetid, dark tenements to modern apartment blocks and high-rises, where individual apartments were reached by elevators. Most American households on farms or in small towns, and even most urban dwellers, lived not in tenements or apartments, but in single-family detached homes throughout this 70-year interval. By 1940, fully 57% of Americans lived in cities, having 2,500 or more inhabitants, a percentage that had more than doubled from 1870. A single word summarizes the interior revolution achieved in urban America during this period. Networked. Within a few decades, urban American homes became networked in a substantial transformation that could never be repeated. Instead of relying on candles and kerosene carried into the home, each home was connected to the electricity network that provided electric light and an ever-growing variety of electric home appliances. Instead of relying on privies and outhouses and cesspools, each home was gradually connected to two more networks, one bringing in a supply of clean running water and the other taking waste out into sewers. Houses of the rich after 1880 and of the working class after 1910 were increasingly supplied with central heating. As of 1940, most central heating was provided by furnaces burning coal or fuel oil, both of which arrived by delivery truck rather than automatically through a pipe. But even in 1940, the nation was well on the way to its current network of connections to reliable and silent natural gas. Another network, that of telephones, also grew rapidly after 1890 and is treated in Chapter 6. Networking inherently implies equality. Everyone, rich and poor, is plugged into the same electric, water, sewer, gas, and telephone network. The poor may only be able to afford to hook up years after the rich, but eventually, they receive the same access. Compare that to 1870, when the rich had servants to do the hauling and carrying of water, coal, and wood that was necessary before the arrival of networks, whereas the working and middle classes had to do the brute force physical labor themselves. Although initially the water delivered to middle and upper class neighborhoods may have been cleaner than that delivered to working class neighborhoods, any such inequality had largely disappeared in urban America by 1929. The networking transformation of urban America happened very quickly by the standards of any age, whether before 1870 or after 1940. As we shall see, 77% of the dwelling units in existence in the United States in 1940 were constructed after 1900, and most of these were initially constructed incorporating the new technologies of electricity, water, and sewer connections. By 1940 in urban America, Electricity was universal. The percentage of homes with washing machines and electric refrigerators had reached 40%, and telephone connections, running water, private bathrooms with modern plumbing fixtures, and central heating had become commonplace. Although it took longer for small-town and farmland America to catch up, by 1940 most of the transition to the modern age had already occurred. Another transition that could happen only once was that from a nation that was almost entirely rural in 1800 to one that, by 1940, was 56% urban.
It was much easier to deliver the modern conveniences to urban America than to the outlying farms and small towns, simply because the housing units were much closer together. These economies of density provide an important explanation for why modern conveniences came first to the cities, then to medium-sized towns, counted as urban, then to small towns having fewer than 2,500 inhabitants, counted as rural, and finally to farms, which were usually at least a half mile apart. The chapter turns first to the size, location, and external environment of American housing. We dissect a multidimensional mosaic, distinguishing between farms, small towns, and cities, between single-family houses, tenements, and apartments, and between city and suburb, and we recognize the particularly poor conditions throughout the American South, especially in rural areas. In 1940, virtually no Southern farmer had access to any of the modern conveniences that had become common in urban areas. The middle part of the chapter traces the evolution of light within homes, including Edison's great invention of 1879 and the magnitude and timing of the spread of water and sewers. Each development is interpreted from the point of view of consumers. When did the transformations happen? What difference did they make to everyday life? How far had they extended by 1940? By maintaining the perspective of changes in the standard of living as viewed by the consumer, we omit most topics related to urban planning, urban politics, and the regulation of electric utilities. The spread of the city is treated in Chapter 5, in which the development of the city is viewed as a corollary of a succession of transportation innovations that steadily increased the distance that was feasible to travel between the home and the workplace. Decisions that encouraged urban sprawl after World War II are reserved for Chapter 10 on housing after 1940. Another deliberate omission from this chapter is the effect of the business cycle. The ease or difficulty of finding jobs varied across recession intervals and across decades, and the decline in the standard of living during the Great Depression stands out. But the Great Depression did not cause housing units to become unplugged from the electricity, water, and sewer networks. The appliances purchased before 1929 still worked to improve the standard of living, and the decade of the 1930s witnessed a sharp increase in the diffusion of electric refrigerators and washing machines. A core theme of this book is that many of the great inventions could happen only once. In the seven decades between 1870 and 1940, the urban dwelling was utterly transformed from a primitive state hard to imagine, as described in Chapter 2, to a level in 1940 surprisingly similar to the way we live today. The core of the housing revolution was the equipping of newly built housing units and the retrofitting of previously built units, with the modern conveniences made possible by networks. The life-changing implications of the revolution, especially in liberating American women, is a central aspect of the increase in the standard of living between 1870 and 1940, and has been largely neglected by the official data on GDP per person. Where Americans Lived, The Urban Transition Popular images of housing in the late 19th century are heavily influenced by social reformers, such as the Danish immigrant newspaper reporter Jacob Rees, whose squalid description of working-class life in New York City and how the other half lives might convey the impression that the bottom half of the income distribution in 1890 lived in crowded, small, poorly ventilated apartments, from which windows looked out on stinking air shafts, and in which a good portion of the rooms had no windows at all. Indeed, in 1890, fully two-thirds of New York City's inhabitants lived in tenements, defined as any building having three or more apartments in the same structure. The tenement law passed in 1867 called for only one water closet per every 20 people, and for sewers only if possible. But these regulations were poorly enforced. Because the share of rural America remained greater than 50% until 1920, Reese's title, How the Other Half Lives, greatly exaggerates the misery of the working class for the nation taken as a whole. 
The rural half of residences in 1920 consisted of single-dwelling detached structures surrounded by open space, not crowded multifamily tenements. New York City, however important as a port of entry for immigrants, represented only a small portion of the American urban population. Indeed, the tenement buildings depicted by Reese, with details provided by Robert Chapin's 1909 survey, were concentrated on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and multifamily dwelling units in most other American cities rarely contained more than two or three units, nor were higher than three stories. Our perspective on the heterogeneity of housing begins in Table 4-1. The first impression is of rapid growth. The population more than tripled over our 1870 to 1940 interval, and the number of households grew almost fivefold. Indeed, it is striking that the number of households and the number of dwelling units so closely coincided, suggesting a small role for vacation homes or other second dwellings. Average household size declined during 1870 to 1940 from 5.0 persons to 3.7 persons. This shrinkage in average household size reflected a declining birth rate and resulted in less crowded living conditions. The most important aspects of Table 4.1 are the division of housing by type of location. The urban share more than doubled from 23.2% in 1870 to 565 in 1940. The share of farm dwellings dropped by almost half, from 38.2% to 23.2% over the same interval. The share of rural non-farm dwellings, i.e. in small towns, likewise decreased, shrinking from 38.6% to 20.3%. Surprisingly, though, the portion of the U.S. population in these villages and small towns increased during the post-war period to regain its 1890 share by 1980, whereas the share of the population living on farms withered away to almost nothing. When were dwellings constructed during the 1870 to 1940 interval? Table 4-2 shows statistics on dwelling units in 1940, including their age and location. Although not surprising in the context of rapid population growth, it is still striking that there were an almost complete turnover of the American housing stock between 1880 and 1940. Of the dwellings that existed in 1940, only 7.3% were built before 1880. Thus, the description of primitive housing conditions provided in Chapter 2 for 1870 applies only to a small minority of dwellings in which people lived in 1940. Even for farm dwellings, 89% were built after 1880. Our image of today's antebellum historic districts in Charleston, South Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia, greatly overstates the importance of old dwellings in the South, where 96% of dwellings occupied in 1940 were built after 1880. Table 4-2 in the bottom row gives the median age of housing in 1940 as 25.4 years. The median date of construction was 1910 in the North, 1919 in the South, and 1922 in the West. Most dwelling units, at least in urban areas, were built after cities had been wired for electricity and had developed the urban sanitation infrastructure of running water and sewer pipes. How rapidly was the housing stock replaced by tearing down old structures and replacing them with the new? If we take the units constructed before 1880 from Table 4-2 and boost the total by the percentage not reporting the construction year, we obtain a total of 2.7 million dwellings that existed in 1940 that had been built before 1880. This compares with a source reporting that in 1880, there were 6.1 million dwelling units. Thus, at least half of the units in existence in 1880 had disappeared by 1940. After 1880, the importance of multifamily buildings increased, but not nearly as much as the tenement critics would imply. Over the four decades, 1900 to 1939, fully 53% of newly constructed urban dwellings consisted of single-family structures. A surprising aspect of the prevalence of single-family detached structures is that most of them were rented 
A further 19% were two-family dwellings. Occupants of these duplex units, with one apartment on the first floor and another on the second floor, had as much light and air for each room as did occupants of single-family dwellings, and they often had access to a yard and garden. The remaining 29% of urban dwellings built between 1900 and 1939 were structures containing three or more dwelling units. But most of these were not tenements. Three-unit wooden triple-deckers built in the early decades of the century are still ubiquitous through the city of Boston. The triple-decker has all the characteristics of a duplex with full exposure to light and air, with the disadvantage of more stair climbing for those in the top unit, and less access per household to a yard or garden. At the other end of the scale were large multi-story elevator buildings, which were a substantial part of the 1920s residential construction boom, and which still line the areas surrounding New York's Park and Fifth Avenues, Chicago's Lakeshore Drive, and streets at the center of other upscale multifamily residential neighborhoods. Evolution of housing units. Fewer rooms, even fewer people. An assessment of living conditions requires a dynamic view that takes account of changes over the life cycle and over time. In the first stage of their life cycle, children in working class families lived in bedrooms that were crowded with two or three children per room. In the next stage of life before marriage, teenagers and young adults may by choice have left their families and lived temporarily in boarding houses or dormitories. Then they may have moved into small apartments after marriage. Crowding increased during the two decades when the children were home and then decreased as children grew up and moved away. Empty nesters did not necessarily move back into small apartments but may have continued to live in their dwellings, tending the gardens of their mainly single-family detached houses. Beyond the life cycle, over time the standard of living was improving at each stage of life. Working-class children had a better chance of arriving at middle-class status as education improved and as the available jobs shifted from back-breaking, tedious, or menial tasks to more pleasant sales, service, and white-collar work. Children born in Franklin Roosevelt's birth year, 1882, may have arrived with their immigrant parents in the great wave of immigration of the 1880s, lived in crowded immigrant working-class quarters of large cities in their childhood, and had their own children born around 1910 into homes equipped with electric light and running water and arrived at in automobiles. The parents born in 1882 and children born in 1910 would together have witnessed the revolution that brought a new world of consumer products, safety, and convenience by the 1920s. The children of 1910 were likely to have completed high school. Some would have gone to college. Their own children, born around 1940, would have grown up in the 1950s surrounded by consumer appliances, television, recorded music, and access to cars. Yet another aspect of dynamism that was peculiarly American concerned intercity and interstate mobility. The constant and endless flow of domestic migration, in addition to that of international immigration, meant that the United States was not only a nation of immigrants, but a nation of migrants. Boston's estimated 1890 population of 450,000 was actually smaller than the 600,000 people who had entered the city in the preceding decade, and the 500,000 people who had departed. In the Middletown studies of Muncie, Indiana, between 1893 and 1898, some 35% of Muncie families moved. Between 1920 and 1924, this proportion rose to 57%. As the share of the population in urban dwellings grew and as that in farm dwellings declined, the most notable change in housing quality was the increase in density and the decline in exterior space that is inherent in an urban environment. Did the amount of interior space per dwelling increase with the standard of living as would be expected if space is a normal good? Though the number of rooms per dwelling unit decreased 
This was entirely because of the shrinking in average household size between 1870 and 1940, from 5.0 persons to 3.7 persons. See Table 4.1. The number of rooms per dwelling unit decreased more slowly, so the number of rooms per person in the unit increased by about 10%. However, an alternative source claims that the number of rooms per person increased by 35% between 1910 and 1940. Either way, this increase in space per person was one component of an increasing standard of living. There is some evidence that houses became smaller and more efficient between 1910 and 1930. One possible cause of the decline in resources invested per dwelling unit was a reduction in dead space. Stairways, corridors, and unusable corners in the typical frame house of the past. Another indication that the move towards smaller houses was real and not a statistical illusion was a widespread rejection, further described later, of overly ornate and elaborate Victorian upper-middle-class houses. By the turn of the century, a shift had begun to simplified floor plans that reduced or eliminated large entry halls and multiple formal parlor rooms, culminating in the explosion of bungalow housing in the period 1910 to 1930. Urban housing, tenements dwarfed by single-family structures. The period between 1900 and World War I was known as the Reform Era and many complaints were published concerning the poor quality of housing for the working class. Detailed investigations were carried out to document the conditions of working class living in Boston, New York, Washington, Chicago, Pittsburgh, and many other cities. The same conditions meet us everywhere. Lot overcrowding and room overcrowding, dark rooms and inadequately lighted rooms, lack of water, lack of sanitary conveniences, dilapidation, excess fire risks, basement and cellar dwellings. The most important single piece of quantitative evidence on New York City working-class housing comes from a detailed 1907 survey of 400 families, reported by Robert Chapin, who found that on average, five people lived in three rooms. Moreover, 60% of these households reported that at least one of their rooms was dark, i.e. windowless. Dark rooms are treated by contemporary observers as nearly ubiquitous. The number of interior rooms in old houses without windows to the outer air is incredible to those who have not studied the subject. New York City had over 350,000 of such rooms in 1901, and then there are millions of rooms, only a little better, whose windows look out on dark, narrow courts and passageways, sometimes mere cracks between two walls. A more vivid account describes living conditions in New York City tenement slum areas. Among the indignities they were forced to suffer were vile privies, dirt-filled sinks, slop oozing down stairwells, children urinating on the walls, dangerously dilapidated stairs, plumbing pipes pockmarked with holes that emitted sewer gases so virulent they were flammable. Though initially, as already noted, the word tenement simply meant any multifamily structure that contained three or more dwelling units, the meaning of the word shifted after the Civil War to mean slum housing. Many of the old law tenements were built with the dumbbell design with the side units extending from the street to the back of the lot, and the middle units recessed in the center to provide a small air shaft. This design allowed the accommodation of 20 or more families on a small lot, usually 25 feet wide by 100 feet deep. The structures were five, six, or seven stories tall, and each floor had four apartments, containing a total of 14 rooms. The air shaft was typically five feet wide and six feet deep. The air shafts invited the tossing of garbage, which in turn made vile odors pervasive, especially in summer, when the windows were opened. Finally, the dumbbell design was banned by a 1901 legislative reform that introduced the new law tenements. Yet even contemporary critics recognized that the housing conditions in New York City were uniquely bad. Quote, Workers in New York were housed worse than any other city in the civilized world, end quote. 
Further evidence can be provided that New York City was a special case. Though half of all New Yorkers lived in buildings with six or more families in 1885, this was true of only 1% of the residents of Philadelphia. Structures housing two or three families made up about half of the housing stock of Chicago and Boston at the same time. Immigrants in other cities typically lived in one-story and two-story structures, not in tall brick buildings. High-rise tenements did not become commonplace in Chicago's slums. Another authority agrees that Chicago had few large-scale tenements like New York's, adding that a desire to prevent the construction of such tenements as well as a concern for the housing conditions of the city's poor people living in smaller tenements explains the housing activity in Chicago. Housing Density, Expansion Through the Streetcar By the standards of Europe, whether exhibited in the narrow, terraced residences in England or the multifamily apartment blocks in continental Europe, the open space of the American Midwestern cities was a revelation. In his classic, The American Commonwealth, James Bryce found, In cities like Cleveland or Chicago, Miles on miles of suburb filled with neat wooden houses, each with its tiny garden plot, owned by the shop assistants and handy craftsmen who return on the horse cars in the evening from their work. The impression which this comfort and plenty makes is heightened by the brilliance and keenness of the air, by the look of freshness and cleanness which even the cities wear. The fog and soot flakes of an English town, as well as its squalor, are wanting. You are in a new world, and a world which knows the sun. Bryce was viewing the American city of the mid-1880s in contrast with crowded and sooty English cities of the same era. Others noted the lower density of American cities than in Europe. Adna Weber in 1899 calculated that the population density of 15 American cities was 22 persons per acre as compared to 158 for 13 German cities. Gradually, between 1840 and 1870, the suburban ideal became based on the virtues of separation rather than physical connections between adjacent dwellings. The lawn was a barrier, a kind of verdant moat separating the household from the threats and temptations of the city. As the outskirts of cities were developed after 1870, Property covenants often required that houses be set back a certain distance from the street and sidewalk. The change in the appearance of the urban space was described by Lewis Mumford. Rows of buildings no longer served as continuous walls, bounding streets that formed a closed corridor. The building, divorced from its close association with the street, was embosomed in the landscape and deliberately absorbed by it. The feasibility of large lawn areas surrounding houses was facilitated by the invention, in the 1860s, of the lightweight lawnmower. These newly built areas, two or three miles from the city center, were made possible by horse-drawn streetcars and from the beginning were called streetcar suburbs. Observers noted that the new streetcars could enable everyone to have a suburban home because they were the first step in the upgrading of living conditions for the whole working class. They were also called the zone of emergence. Even in the late 19th century, developers in places such as Chicago were building streetcar suburbs on large tracts of land and selling them on installment plans. And some developers had interlocking financial relationships with the developers of streetcar lines for houses in the new developments could not be sold unless they could be reached by streetcar. What Bryce was observing in Chicago is called by architectural historians the working man's cottage. These were one-story structures containing four to six rooms, plainly built, featuring little or no ornamentation. Though some deteriorated or were replaced by crowded multifamily living units, many others survived and were improved with electricity and plumbing in the early years of the 20th century. Cottage neighborhoods provided housing for the great wave of Southern and Central Europeans who arrived during these years, who in many Midwestern cities, such as Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, and Milwaukee, 
lived in conditions much better than those offered by the New York City tenements. A substantial fraction of these cottages were owned by the families that occupied them, and they only gradually added modern conveniences as their owners could afford the installation cost. In Chicago, the typical lot size for worker cottages in the late 19th century was 25 by 125 feet. A one-story, four-room workers' cottage in Chicago could be built in 1886 for $600, and a two-story dwelling with a fireplace could be built for about $1,300. Independent evidence suggests that working-class residential dwellings could be built for $1 per square foot during the entire period between 1880 and 1905. These cottages did not initially incorporate bathrooms or central heating. After the coal or wood-fired enclosed stove was invented in the 1870s and 1880s, such stoves became the dominant form of heating, and bedrooms were typically cold in the winter without separate heating. First appearing in the 1860s, many of these dwellings had basements that provided additional living space, and that sometimes, by providing rentable basement rooms, allowed families to attract boarders and add enough income to afford home ownership. Lodging, or the rental of space for overnight sleeping quarters, was a much more common practice than implied by the number of lodging houses. Many working-class women were trapped at home by their large numbers of children. In 1870, a woman who had five children could be expected to raise the children over 20 to 22 years, until the youngest child had reached age 16 assuming that the children had been born soon after one another. If this woman had her first child at age 23, she would not have been able to enter the labor force until age 45 or older. One of the few ways that women could supplement their income was taking in lodgers, and lodging was very common in urban America between 1870 and 1920. Chapin's 1907 survey reports that about one-third of the families in the survey took in lodgers, and from their fees raised their family income by between 10% and 15%. Some accounts of boarders suggest a single boarder occupying a bed in a corner of the kitchen or in some other inconspicuous space, but others report as many as 6 to 12 persons squeezing into small houses containing only a few rooms. Some immigrant families rented out beds on double shifts, so that workers on different schedules shared the same bed. Agreements with boarders included complex arrangements for services provided by the housewife, including food preparation and laundry. The first column in Table 4-3 provides a comprehensive time series of the percentage of urban households having boarders. This fell by half from 23% to 11% between 1900 and 1930, and then temporarily increased in 1940 as a result of depressed economic conditions in the 1930s. But by 1960, the practice had virtually disappeared, except in unusual situations. For instance, in large houses located close to college campuses that provided rooming for college students. In the late 19th century, the newer Midwestern cities, such as Milwaukee, had no older and inferior housing stock to be turned over to recently arrived working-class immigrants, so new housing was built not just for middle-class families, but also for immigrants. One area in the city's poorest district contained newly built homes built for Polish immigrants. A house that Clifford Clark describes as typical was on a deep lot with 30 feet of frontage. The house built in the 1890s was one and a half stories and an outer dimension of 22 by 40 feet, indicating a total area of about 1,250 square feet. The family consisted of the husband, wife, and six children. A second-generation German iron molder, described as having climbed the next step up the social ladder, lived in a two-story structure. Though the single-family detached dwellings occupied by the working class may have been small, the typical middle-class house of the late 19th century was comparable in size to some of today's suburban single-family units.
Custom-built houses designed by architects competed with lower-cost mail-order plan books long before Sears Roebuck began selling mail-order complete houses in the early 20th century. The typical house had two stories, with four rooms on each story. Details on room sizes provided with some of the plans suggest that typical houses contained roughly 1,000 to 1,500 square feet. Elaborate ornamentation was quite common and its cost had been greatly reduced as manufacturers learned to replace skilled craftsmen with modern machines. Instead of stone carvers who chiseled the cornices, there was a machine that stamped out cheap tin imitations. Instead of wood carvers, a hydraulic press squeezed wood into intricate carved shapes. About 10% of residents of major cities in the 1880s owned substantial homes large enough to require the services of at least one servant. Many of these houses were in the streetcar suburbs, which were laid out between 1850 and 1900. Suburban housing from the start was designed to house different classes and income levels in the same area so that workmen, retail merchants, and household servants would be able to tend to the needs of middle and upper class families. Unlike post-World War II suburbs, which are relatively homogeneous socioeconomically, those of the tracked city, streetcar suburbs, were not restricted to a single economic class. Early maps of these suburbs, such as Hinsdale and Evanston, Illinois, show that they were divided up into a diverse set of lot sizes, with frontages ranging from 30 to as much as 200 feet, in contrast to narrower lots prevalent in the inner city. Most of these late 19th century houses still exist, having benefited from continuous re-equipping and improvements. A stark difference between development in 1870 to 1900 and after 1900 was the diversity of styles and sizes of housing within a given community. The Bungalow Movement, Symbol of Change Some accounts of changes in American urban housing over the 1870 to 1930 period paint a picture in which the large Victorian house of 1880 to 1900 was replaced by the much smaller and simpler bungalow house built between 1910 and 1930. However, the reality is more complex. The bungalow dwelling represented the first stage of a multi-step process by which the pre-1900 working class became the broad middle class of the 1950s and beyond. The efficiency of the bungalow design coincided with a steady increase in real income. Innovations that reduced the real cost of residential structures allowed working class families to move from small and flimsy cottages and crowded tenement rental dwellings to solid homes that they could afford to buy on the installment plan. The emphasis on the bungalow in this chapter represents its central role in the democratization of owner-occupied housing in the early 20th century when automobiles were almost simultaneously creating a radical transformation in the freedom of movement for many families. The bungalow was initially developed in the Los Angeles area, but had spread to Chicago by 1905, where it led the transition of working-class families to the modern age and modern conveniences. In the words of one author, the more prosperous segment of the working class became the primary beneficiaries of the new bungalow construction in the 1920s. Bungalow construction still dominates Chicago's enormous bungalow belt, which spreads across roughly one-third of the 225 square miles within Chicago's city limits. Some 80,000 bungalow houses were built between 1910 and 1930 and an additional 200,000 units were built in adjacent suburbs. The bungalow became the ubiquitous house in Chicago's first market for modern housing, the basic building block in a city of neighborhoods. By combining affordable artistry and affordable comfort so successfully, it also proved to be one of the city's most significant contributions to 20th century architecture. The bungalow represented the antithesis of the Victorian home. Simple, informal, and efficient. The standard bungalow had just one story, but many added additional bedrooms on the second floor by piercing the roof line with low, flat dormers. Exterior materials were favored that required no maintenance, including redwood in California.
brick in Chicago, stone in New England, and adobe in Arizona. A typical bungalow had 1,000 to 1,200 square feet on the first floor and another 300 or 400 feet of extra bedrooms on the second floor. Chicago bungalows were built with generous windows, a full basement, and included the modern amenities of central heat, electric service, and indoor plumbing. Because Chicago was such a large city and was growing so quickly between 1900 and 1930, the particular features of its bungalow belt are of great interest in providing a leading example of the nationwide progress achieved during this era that was duplicated in other large areas and medium-sized cities. Reflecting the arrival of the automobile age, all bungalows were built with garages in the back, and every block was bisected by a service alley through which cars entered and from which garbage was collected. Poles for electric and telephone wires were all hidden away in the alleys, giving the Chicago streetscape a neat, clean look, featuring landscaped parkways between the paved sidewalk and the street, with trees planted in the parkways. The floor plan on the first floor represented a radical change from the standard Victorian house. Anticipating the post-war family room that was often integrated with the kitchen as a single room, the bungalow often merged the living room and dining room into one larger common space adjacent to the kitchen. The Victorian entry hall had been eliminated. An entry was often directly into the combined living room and dining room. While bungalows with their 25 or 30-foot lots strike us today as unacceptably small, they are deceptive from the outside. Their popularity doubtless resulted from their extremely low cost, sometimes as little as $1 per square foot, excluding the cost of the land. The feasibility of building a bungalow at such a low price was fostered by the aggressive sales by Sears Roebuck and others of a complete set of prefabricated materials that were sent to the building location, requiring only the assembly of the materials. Even after the post-World War I inflation, Sears offered all the components of a Chicago-style bungalow for between $750 and $2,000, to which the purchaser would need to add the cost of acquiring the land and the labor to put together the Sears-provided material. Sears publicity bragged that one of its houses could be converted from a stack of pre-cut materials to a finished house in 352 carpenter hours. The use of standardized plans and prefabricated materials in bungalow building represented the culmination of a long process of innovations in construction, dating back to the mid-19th century that brought access to single-family home ownership to a substantial share of the population. Daniel Siekel has shown that the real price of nails dropped by a factor of 10 between 1830 and 1930. Together with the development of thin-cut lumber for balloon frame construction, cheaper nails greatly reduced the real price of construction per square foot, compared to the previous technology of homes crafted out of local materials by skilled carpenters. Despite the common size and tightly spaced arrangement of bungalows in a city such as Chicago, Builders achieved a variety of appearance by using many sizes and shapes of windows, different colors of brick, and decorative limestone elements for window frames, caps for staircases, and stone window boxes for summer flowers. Interior elements were upscale in comparison to many subdivisions built after 1945. Features included built-in furniture and cabinets, a fireplace, and hardwood floors. Interior mass-produced wood furniture was part of the standard equipment of bungalows before they were purchased, including built-in bookcases, window seats, mantles, china closets, breakfast benches, dressing tables, and radiator enclosures. The wide variety of decorative elements provided by masons and the woodworking industry was supplemented by the capital-intensive mass production of plumbing, heating, and kitchen equipment. Between metropolis and farm, small towns and medium-sized cities. Most of our attention has been devoted to large urban areas. What about the middle, the medium-sized cities in which so many Americans lived in the 1920s?
Numerous details of housing conditions are contained in Robert and Helen Lynn's classic 1929 survey report on Muncie, Indiana. A city of 38,000 people living in 9,200 dwelling units, or 4.13 per unit. Very close to the 4.0 ratio of population to occupied dwellings recorded for 1930 in Table 4.1. In Muncie, 86% of the housing units were single family, each standing on a separate patch of ground, and 10% were in two family units. Only 1% were in apartments. One third of working class families interviewed, and 80% of business class families lived in single family homes that had two stories of space within a single dwelling unit. In contrast to the lot frontage of 25 to 30 feet common in Chicago, Muncie lot frontages were 40 feet. Ages of homes were similar to those in the 1940 census data presented in Table 4-2, which recorded that 72% of existing homes in 1929 were built between 1900 and 1929. The need for driveways and garages to accommodate automobiles had reduced the size of yards and gardens. Gardens were further squeezed by a tendency to shrink lot sizes on blocks developed in the 1920s compared to those developed in the 1880s. The Lins distinguish between the homes of the poorer working man and the working man with more money. The differences involve behavior, furnishings, and equipment more than house size. When the poorer working man arrives home, he walks up the frequently unpaved street, turns in at a bare yard littered with a rusty velocipede or worn-out automobile tires, opens a sagging door. From this room, the whole house is visible. The kitchen with table and floor swarming with flies and often strewn with bread crusts, orange skins, torn papers, and lumps of coal and wood. In contrast, the better-off member of the working class walks in past geraniums in window boxes. The sewing machine stands in the living room or dining room. The ironing board with its neat piles of clothes stretches across one corner of the kitchen. The array of dwellings ranges across the classes from mean and cluttered to the spacious and restful. There was no sharp distinction between middle-class and working-class housing in early 20th century small towns. The small town's street grid initially set up all lot sizes to be the same. The upper classes escaped this discipline only by combining several lots. Because both the middle and working classes lived in single-family dwellings, the quality distinctions were subtle. The chances of living next door to someone substantially richer or poorer than oneself was high in the American small town in the early 20th century. The idea of small town social equality was encouraged by residential mixing. All residents of small towns experienced much lower densities than the crowded urban tenement conditions described by Reese, Edith Wood, and other social reformers. By definition, the countryside surrounded the small town and was a short walk away for the gentry and working class alike. Almost every family had a garden that produced vegetables in the summer. Strawberries came in May, peas and new potatoes followed, then string beans, beets, turnips, carrots, sweet corn, tomatoes, and the full tide of summer's fruits. The sturdy single-family farm dwellings of the North and West contrasted with greatly inferior conditions in the South. A survey carried out in North Carolina in the mid-1920s described the cabins in which most black tenant farmers lived. There were one to three rooms in the black dwellings, whereas those for whites averaged four rooms. There was no plaster or other covering on the walls, and in place of window glass was a simple opening with no sash. Some window openings were protected by shutters to keep the rainwater from coming in. About one quarter of the families had four people or more per bedroom. Despite the advances in housing quality for many Americans, Deep regional divides still existed. Changes in Rural Farm Housing The Limit of Modern Conveniences James Bryce's admiration for the individual worker cottages on the suburban-like streets of Midwestern cities was understated compared to his rhapsodic view of life on the American farm. All over the wide west, 
From Lake Ontario to the upper Missouri, one travels past farms of two to three hundred acres, in every one of which there is a spacious farmhouse among orchards and meadows. Just as the unvarying street grid defined the spatial relationships in cities from New York, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C., westward, so the grid applied to the dividing lines between farms in the Northwest Territories beyond the Appalachians. The 200 to 300 acre farms that Bryce observed in the North and Central states resulted from an unvarying division of the empty territory of the Northwest Territories and the Louisiana Purchase into square mile portions of 640 acres. Half a square mile came out at 320 acres, similar to the farm sizes that Bryce observed. But historical statistics place the median size of the American farm as less than half that size, 153 acres in 1870, 147 acres in 1900, and 157 acres in 1930, still substantial from Bryce's European perspective. In light of Frederick Jackson Turner's much-discussed 1893 hypothesis of the closing of the frontier, it is somewhat surprising to note, as shown in Table 4-2, that substantially more than two-thirds of American farm dwellings in existence in 1940 were built after 1900. Many of the newly constructed farmhouses were replacements for the sod huts and log cabins that immigrant farmers initially built to shelter their families from winter in the northern and western plains. These primitive structures more closely resembled sheds than solid, comfortable houses. The quality of farmhouses steadily improved during 1870 to 1940, at least outside the South. The two-story single-family detached farmhouses were similar to single-family detached dwellings built in small towns and all but the largest cities in the late 19th century, including the standard upper working-class homes of Muncie, Indiana, as portrayed by the Lynns. The first floor consisted of a kitchen, a parlor or sitting room, and perhaps a dining room. The second floor usually included three bedrooms, one for the parents, one for the male children and another for the female children. Heating transitioned from the open hearth fireplace to the enclosed iron stove slash boiler between 1870 and 1900. The period of farm prosperity from 1900 to 1920 was accompanied by improvements in farm dwellings, partly thanks to the ease of buying through the Ward's and Sears catalogs. Farm families purchased furniture, fabrics, and kitchen devices. The age-old problem of carrying water was partly solved by linking a cistern to the kitchen with a hand pump, thus reducing the burden of the endless female task of carrying water into and out of the house. As these primitive pumps were being added, so were window screens and screened doors, ridding farmhouse interiors of flying insects. Yet the farmers of America lagged increasingly behind their urban fellow citizens in part because the modern conveniences were so slow to arrive. Relatively few farmers had access to electricity, running water, and indoor plumbing by 1940. Indeed, the 1920s were a period of depression, both economically and emotionally, in America's farmland. Farmers were restless with the feeling that they had been bypassed by modern progress. An unease captured by the World War I popular song, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? The cities of the 1920s were full of excitement and popular culture. Whereas on the farm, economic distress, population decline, and psychological doubt and despair seemed to sap the lifeblood of the countryside. A farmer from Tennessee captured this unease with the memorable contrast. The greatest thing on earth is to have the love of God in your heart, and the next greatest thing is to have electricity in your house. This accords with the primary theme of this chapter, that the modern conveniences made urban dwellers more equal, but made urban and rural life ever more different. The surge of one-time only changes, creating the modern dwelling. 1870 to 1940. The revolution that remade the American dwelling and the American standard of living occurred during a relatively small slice of human history. 
mainly between 1910 and 1940. Viewed from the perspective of millennia of economic stagnation, the networked modern conveniences arrived in a rush, from virtual invisibility in 1910 urban America to near pervasiveness in 1940. This section provides an overview of the percentage of housing units equipped with each of the following in each decade between 1890 and 1970. Running water, indoor flush toilets, central heating, electricity as the primary lighting source, washing machines, and mechanical refrigerators. For comparison and perspective, we also plot the diffusion of the automobile, otherwise treated in Chapter 5, and of the radio. Chapter 6. All the diffusion percentages in figures 4.1 and 4.2 are taken from the same work, which in turn goes into considerable detail about the most consistent sources. The percentages are divided into two diagrams for visual clarity, with the built-in equipment of the house in figure 4.1 and the appliances together with the automobile, plotted in figure 4.2. Starting in 1900, the modern conveniences had barely tiptoed onto the stage. Running water had reached one-third of dwelling units. Whereas indoor flush toilets were present in about 15% of homes, the two figures indicate that all the plotted lines exceeded 40% by 1940. Electricity in the automobile explode upward from near 0% in 1900 to 1930. When electricity had reached 68%, Automobiles had reached 60%, and indoor toilets had reached 50%. Despite depressed economic conditions in the 1930s and wartime production prohibitions in World War II, the interval 1930 to 1950 reflected the most rapid adoption of the mechanical refrigerator and central heating. By 1970, the diffusion rates had clustered into two groups. Automobiles, washing machines, and central heating reached a plateau of about 80% coverage. Some families in dense urban environments, such as New York City, chose not to have cars and instead relied on public transit. Some apartment dwellers did not have room for washing machines and chose to rely on the nearby laundromat. And central heating was not necessary in some warm areas of the South and Southwest. Otherwise, all other plotted lines reached 96% to 100% by 1970. A revolution had occurred in 70 years, much of it in 40 years. This transformation of the quality of the dwelling unit was fundamental and could happen only once. Today's houses and apartments are much more similar to those of 1940 than those of 1940 are to their predecessors of 1900. The Miracle of Electrification, Lighting and Early Appliances Through 1940 Electrification's effects was universal and revolutionary, although it took 50 years to reach most urban homes and even longer to change life in farm and rural non-farm dwellings. As with plumbing, running water, and central heating, the rich obtained the modern conveniences before the middle class or the poor, city dwellers before small towns and farms, and the northern and western states before the south. In a mere 50 years, the residential United States underwent a transformation from the home production of heat and light by household members who chopped wood, hauled coal, and tended kerosene lamps, to a new era of gas and electricity, purchased as commodities and arriving automatically at the dwelling unit without having to be physically carried. When electricity arrived, Gone was the darkness, not to mention the air pollution emitted by candles, wax lamps, and gas lamps, as well as the care and feeding of kerosene lamps, which included filling, emptying, and wick trimming. That said, however, the arrival of electricity moved the pollution from inside of the home to the outside. For the generation of electricity from coal-fired plants sent carbon emissions into the atmosphere. From today's perspective, an essential characteristic of the 1870 dwelling was its dimness after dark. The light emitted by a single candle at a distance of one foot at a given angle defines the lumen, and a single wax candle emits about 13 lumens, whereas a 100-watt filament bulb emits about 1,200 lumens.
None of the sources of illumination available in 1870 produced more than six to eight candle hours, or roughly 80 to 100 lumens. Thus, a single state-of-the-art lamp burning town gas, whale oil, or kerosene emitted light between one-twelfth and one-fifteenth the intensity of a single 100-watt light bulb. Before electric light was invented in 1879, Illumination inside the home at night required that a fuel be burned, producing not just a flame, but also some degree of odor and smoke. In 1870, kerosene lamps were a relatively recent invention, having been introduced in the 1850s. And many homes still used candles and whale oil lamps. Kerosene was prized for its clear flame and illumination power, burning as brightly as 10 candles. Compared to whale oil, kerosene was less dangerous, having a higher flashpoint, having a lighter weight, and selling for a tenth of the price. The discovery of petroleum in Pennsylvania gave kerosene to the world, and life to the few remaining whales. The main drawback of kerosene was the need for constant cleaning of lamps to maintain brightness and also maintain safety. Town gas, a byproduct of turning bituminous coal into coke, had been used in England since the early years of the 19th century. Its first use for illumination was in the cotton spinning plants of northern England, where during the dark half of the year lighting was necessary to support the long workday. Gas lamps had a brighter and whiter flame than oil lamps and candles, but the light flickered and the lamps gave off, through the burning process, emissions of ammonia, sulfur, carbon dioxide, and water. Furthermore, gas lamps consumed oxygen, causing breathing problems for people in poorly ventilated rooms. Their discharges and consumption of oxygen were less a problem outdoors than inside. So they became the standard form of street lighting, dazzling visitors to Paris in the 1820s and New York City in the 1830s. In most cities, only the wealthiest neighborhoods benefited from gas light. Though gas pipes were not extended to the poorer neighborhoods, the gas works were nonetheless located there, with their furnaces belching a dense, foul smoke that permeated everything with a sulfurous stench. The gas works contaminated nearby soils and subsoils with ammonia and sulfur, polluted water supplies, and drove the surrounding area into decline. Gas explosions were frequent enough to make the gas supply unreliable. Many homes used a mix of gas and oil lamps, preferring to keep gas and its odor out of personal spaces, such as bedrooms. Such lamps, along with open fires for heating, posed a substantial fire risk for households of the 19th century. Thomas Edison did not invent the electric light, but he was responsible for making it commercially viable in the United States partly because he combined a practical electric lamp with the development of electric power generation, starting with the Pearl Street Station in New York City in 1882. Edison's unique contribution was his solution of the double problem of inventing an efficient light bulb that could be manufactured in bulk, while also establishing electric generating stations to bring power into the individual home. Compared with the international celebration of the Golden Spike in 1869, see Chapter 2, the moment when electric light became commercially viable was a much quieter affair. Throughout 1879, Edison's laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, had been focused on the search for the best material for the filament in the electric light bulb. Finally, it all came together on the night of October 22, 1879. At 1.30 in the morning, Bachelor and Jell, watched by Edison, began on the ninth fiber, a plain carbonized cotton thread filament, set up in a vacuum glass bulb. They attached the batteries, and the bulb's soft incandescent glow lit up the dark laboratory, the bottles lining the shelves reflecting its gleam. As had many other experimental model, the bulb glowed bright, but this time, the lamp still shone hour after hour through that night. The morning came and went, and still the cotton thread filament radiated its incandescent light. Lunchtime passed, and the carbonized cotton fiber still glowed. At 4 p.m., the glass bulb cracked, and the light went out.
14 and a half hours. Few, if any, inventions have been more enthusiastically welcomed than electric light. Throughout the winter of 1879 and 1880, thousands traveled to Menlo Park to see the light of the future, including farmers whose houses would never be electrified in their lifetimes. Travelers on the nearby Pennsylvania Railroad could see the brilliant lights glowing in the Edison offices. The news was announced to the world on December 21st, 1879, with a full-page story in the New York Herald, opened by this dramatic and long-winded headline, Edison's Light, the Great Inventor's Triumph in Electric Illumination, a scrap of paper. It makes a light without gas or flame, cheaper than oil, success in a cotton thread. On New Year's Eve of 1879, 3,000 people converged by train, carriage, and farm wagon on the Edison Laboratory to witness the brilliant display, a planned laboratory open house of dazzling modernity to launch the new decade. The contrast with all preceding forms of light was an unambiguous and stark improvement, one of the greatest in the history of invention. Part of Edison's Menlo Park demonstrations for investors and New York City politicians was a display of 300 outdoor lights that he turned off and then on in instantaneous unison. This was one of the most surprising aspects of electric light, the ability to turn it on and off with a click, without gaslight's need for individual lighting and snuffing. Here was a little click that meant light was contained in a glass vacuum and need never again be linked with a flame or coaxed forth and adjusted. Light that did not waver, tip, drip, stink, or consume oxygen, and would not spontaneously ignite cloth dust in factories or hay in the mow. A child could be left alone with it. The initial electric lamps were about three times brighter than the brightest kerosene lamps. But by 1920, Improvements in the metal filaments made them 10 times brighter than kerosene and about 100 times brighter than a candle. Electric lights are an example of a technology that had a great burst of innovation early, in this case 1880 to 1920, and then stood still afterwards. Although the fluorescent bulb had come to dominate lighting in commercial and industrial settings by 1950, Virtually nothing changed in home illumination from 1920 until the development of the compact fluorescent bulb after 1990. Nothing in the past hundred years matches the sharp distinction between creating light with a flame and creating it with electricity. Although some argue that the replacement of the horse by the motor vehicle was an even more fundamental invention. This is the central theme of Chapter 5. William Nordhaus made a heroic and convincing attempt to calculate the price of light over the centuries. An efficient kerosene lamp of 1875 to 85 produced a lumen of light at about a tenth the cost of a tallow candle from 1800. By another metric, $20 per year would light a house for three hours in the evening with the light emitted by five candles, or 5,500 candle hours per year. Advances in town gas and kerosene lamps by 1890, before electricity, would allow the same $20 to purchase 73,000 candle hours per year. The initial Edison electric light bulb was priced about equal to the best kerosene lamp, and this price dropped by a factor of six by 1920. Taking into account that by 1920, the electric light was 10 times more powerful than a kerosene lamp, the same $20 would purchase 4.4 million candle hours per year. Filament incandescent bulbs cost about the same per lumen in 1990 as in 1920 in nominal terms. But in real terms, their cost was much lower, by another factor of eight. None of this decline in prices has been heretofore captured by official price indexes. And the consumer surplus captured by this decline in prices is one of many reasons to consider the growth of real income per capita during 1890 to 1940 substantially understated. Note that these price comparisons are all based on the quantity of light emitted by a device. So all the price declines are understated, thanks to the improvement in the quality of light. All those improvements in quality, no more odors, 
No need to clean lamp chimneys. No more danger of fires. No more flickering. Are completely missed, not only by traditional measures of the cost of living, but also by Nordhaus's creative attempts to link together the prices per lumen of candles, few lamps, and electric light bulbs. Only 3% of American homes had electric service in 1900. By 1912, three decades after Edison's Pearl Street Power Station opened, only 16% of American homes were connected to a central power station. The annual output of electric power per capita doubled every seven years from 1902 to 1915, and doubled every six years from 1915 to 1929. This power was supplied not just for light and appliances within the home, but also for manufacturing, retailing, and electric railways and streetcars. Rapid growth in the consumption of electric power was stimulated by a reduction in its normal price from 16.2 cents to 6.3 cents per kilowatt hour between 1902 and 1929, which converts to an inflation-adjusted price decline of 81% in just 27 years, or 6.0% per year. Table 44 supplements figure 41 by contrasting for the year 1940 the stark differences between the extent of electrification in urban America and electrification at the other extreme farms especially farms in the south Table 44 shows that light was provided by electricity in 96% of dwellings in urban areas in 78% in small towns and in 31% on farms in general but only 16% of farms in the South. More than 60 years after Edison's successful experiment to develop the electric light bulb, 80% of Southern farm families used kerosene or other fuels for lighting. The epical transition from dirty and difficult housework to the modern electric kitchen of the 1950s was just underway in 1917. In that year, General Electric summed up the appeal of electric appliances as electric servants, dependable for the muscle part of the washing, ironing, cleaning, and sewing. They could do all your cooking, without matches, without soot, without coal, without argument, in a cool kitchen. Electric household appliances were quickly invented, but were slow to reach the average household. Adoption was initially held back by the flimsy electric wiring initially installed in houses, sufficient only to supply light. The heavier electric drain of stoves, refrigerators, washing machines, and irons required rewiring and faced the obstacle that during 1900 to 1920, there was as yet no standardization of electric plugs and electric outlets. In fact, there was not even standardization on today's alternating current, for some electric companies offered direct current as late as the 1930s. Moreover, voltage varied. Washing machines had developed substantially by 1940, reaching 40% of homes in that year. Two models of electric ringer washing machines were offered in the 1928 Sears Roebuck catalog at prices of $79 and $92. This can be compared to median family income in Muncie, Indiana in 1925, as cited earlier, of $1,450, equal to $28 per week. Thus, the least expensive washing machine cost the equivalent of about three weeks of income. Gradually, as washing machines were hooked up to running water and waste pipes, the multiple tasks involved in doing the weekly laundry became centralized in the basement, which was also the location of the furnace or boiler once central heating arrived. Electric refrigerators initially made slower progress, being expensive at a time when ice boxes were ubiquitous and ice delivery reliable and cheap. There were virtually no mechanical refrigerators until 1920, and they were in only 8% of dwelling units in 1930. As late as 1928, the Sears catalog referred to the icebox as a refrigerator. But then the percentage of households that had refrigerators soared to 44% in 1940. This explosion of use in the 1930s, despite the Great Depression, reflected how the refrigerator was initially much more expensive than the washing machine.
$775 in 1919 and $568 by 1926. Sales skyrocketed during the 1930s, from 1 million sold in the entire decade of 1919 to 29, to 2.5 million by 1932 and 6 million by 1941. The timing of the price reduction can be linked to the first electric refrigerator offered in the 1931 Sears catalog for between $137 and $205. As shown in Table 4-4, the percentage usage of mechanical refrigerators in 1940 ranged from 56% in urban America to only 10% on southern farms. The appliance most enthusiastically adopted besides the electric light was the electric iron. First sold in 1893, electric irons eliminated the need continually to heat or reheat the heavy iron on a gas or wood stove. The temperature was hard to adjust, and scorching of clothes was common. The primitiveness of flat irons that needed to be independently heated was one of the reasons in addition to the absence of washing machines, why home laundry was so time-consuming and tedious. As with most appliances, however, key improvements had to wait for decades. In the case of the electric iron, the automatic thermostat was introduced only in 1927. Before then, the iron was either on or off. The 1928 Sears catalog displays four different models of irons, ranging in price from $1.98 to $4.95, although none of the descriptions mentions any kind of temperature control. And only the more expensive models had on-off switches. Using the Muncie median income level, an iron could be bought for less than one day's income. By 1940, 79% of Americans had electric light, and nearly as many had electric irons. Another popular electric appliance was the vacuum cleaner which could be purchased for about one week's income. Nevertheless, the electrification of the American home was rudimentary in 1929. Electric consumption in 1929 was enough to power three 100-watt electric bulbs for five hours per day, with no power left over for any other use. The annual growth rate of residential electricity consumption roughly doubled in every decade from 1910 to 1960. The variety of consumer appliances available in 1929 is provided by research carried out by Chicago's electric company, showing that more than 80% of residents of all classes by then had an electric iron and vacuum cleaner. Next, with 53%, was the radio. The only other appliances with usage greater than 30% were the toaster and washing machine, 37% and 36%. Appliances with usage by between 10% and 30% of Chicagoans in 1929 were the percolator, 16%, refrigerator, 10%, fan, 10%, and electric heater, 10%. Contemporary accounts focused not on these percentages, but on the revolution of electricity itself. The daily cycle of natural light and darkness no longer dictated the activities in which household members could participate. Because electric light was so much brighter than kerosene or gas lamps, a wider variety of activities became possible in the dark hours of the day, particularly in the winter. Household electrification, both through lighting and appliances, radically changed the daily lives of millions of Americans. The water flows in and out, the greatest revolution of all. The modern conveniences of running water and indoor toilets took a long time to become commonplace. In the 1890s, these conveniences were known to only a few of the very wealthy. Most houses in the 1890s, from densely packed urban tenements to single-family farmhouses, lacked running water. Conditions were worst for tenement dwellers. Tenants had to go out into the hallway to use water closets, or into an exterior courtyard to use privies. Going outside one's private quarters was more than inconvenient. It was degrading when residents in two or more households had to share a single water closet. <laughs>
People unable to wait to relieve themselves resorted to the nearest private corner or vacant lot. The greatest curse of the rural and urban housewife was the need to carry fresh water into the house and dirty water out of the house. Even in the early 20th century, working class housewives had to haul water from hydrants in the street, a task little different from centuries when farm housewives had brought water from the nearest creek or well. All the water for cooking, dishwashing, bathing, laundry, and house cleaning had to be carried in and then hauled back out after use. The pace of infrastructure investment mattered. Networks had to arrive to make the modern conveniences possible. Just as electric light could not be purchased for the home until an electric company had brought electric wires to the neighborhood, so households could not simply go out and buy running water. They had to wait until municipal waterworks extended piping to their area. Considering that the earliest municipal waterworks was built in Philadelphia in 1801, progress was extremely slow until about 1870. Most communities drank their own sewage or that of their neighbors upstream. Typhoid fever and dysentery became endemic, and urban mortality rates were shockingly high. But then an upsurge in the number of municipal waterworks occurred, from 244 in 1870 to 9,850 in 1924. The initial impetus was to improve public health by eliminating waterborne diseases, rather than to eliminate the housewife's burden of hauling water in and out. Additional motivations included firefighting, street cleaning, and manufacturing. By the turn of the century, most cities had sewers, but water was treated, purified, and filtered only by 1900. Sources date the invention of the first plunger-type water closet in 1875, implying that in 1870, urban dwellers relied on chamber pots and open windows and backyards to dispose of their waste, in addition to the universal outdoor privy. Only in the 1870s was knowledge developed about the design of drainage and venting procedures for toilets, particularly to prevent sewer gases from backing up into the home. Before 1870, the relatively small number of dwellings that had indoor plumbing fixtures obtained the water so used from privately owned wells or from cisterns, delivered into the house by a system of shoddy pipes and pumps. Waste was delivered to cesspools, so neither the water nor the waste had any connection to the outside world. Even mansions and luxury country houses may have been equipped with modern plumbing fixtures, but without sewer connections, they were plagued with the ooze of the cesspool that penetrated the foundation wall, and settling of the foundation cracked pipes and allowed sewer gases to permeate the house's interior air. The development of municipal waterworks created an unexpected problem. The increased amount of water entering the house had to exit the house and increased wastewater quantities had nowhere to go before the development of urban sewer systems. So serious had this situation become in Boston that in 1844, an ordinance was passed prohibiting the taking of baths without a doctor's order. The urgency felt to develop a wastewater sewer system reflected the public demand to end the need for repeated cleaning of privy vaults and cesspools. The rapidly increasing availability of public water supplies during 1870 to 1900 linked household plumbing into a network of water and waste pipes that eventually extended over entire cities. The nationwide percentage of private indoor toilets was between 10% and 20% until 1920, after which the percentage jumped to 50% in 1930 and 60% in 1940. There was no running water in Muncie, Indiana before 1885. By 1890, there were not over two dozen complete bathrooms in the entire city. Water was pumped to the back door or kitchen from a well or cistern. For roughly 95% of families in 1890, taking a bath meant lugging a heavy wooden or tin tub into a bedroom, or more usually, the warm kitchen, and filling it half full of water from the pump heated on the kitchen stove. By 1925, running water had reached 75% of Muncie's dwellings, and two-thirds had sewer connections. At that point, 
All new houses, except the very cheapest, had bathrooms, and older houses were installing them. Simultaneous with the extension of urban water infrastructure was the entrepreneurial effort to develop affordable and reliable modern plumbing fixtures. The plumbing supply industry struggled to mass-produce plumbing fixtures that worked properly and did not leak. This was achieved only after 1915. There was rapid change at the turn of the century. Though the Sears catalog included only sinks among the plumbing fixtures it offered in 1897, by 1908 it offered several full sets of bathroom equipment, including a clawfoot bathtub, a porcelain enameled sink, and a toilet that today would be considered an elegant antique with its golden oak tank and seat. The entire three-part outfit cost only $43.80, equal to about three weeks' working-class income at the time, and had a shipping weight of 480 pounds. Table 4-4 shows that private flush toilets and private bathrooms reached fewer homes in 1940 than did running water itself. Nationwide, 60% of families had private flush toilets, leaving the remaining 40% either sharing toilets or still mired in the previous century, relying on outside toilets, privies, or no privy at all. Just as for electricity and running water, these percentages were much higher in urban America and much lower in small towns and on farms. The percentage with private flush toilets in 1940 ranged from 83% for urban dwellings to 5% for southern farms, and for private bathtubs they ranged from 78% for urban families to 5% for southern farms. By 1940, the American bathroom had reached its standard form, which has been little changed until today, including a recessed tub, tiled floors and walls, a single-unit toilet, an enameled sink, and a medicine chest. The gradual diffusion of running water, indoor plumbing, and private bathrooms brought with it another less tangible luxury, personal privacy. Both rural and urban families in the late 19th century spent most of their time in the kitchen, where the heat source was located. Not only did they cook and eat there, but they bathed, washed, and socialized there. And bathing, albeit infrequent by today's standards, became a public event. The rapid growth in private bathrooms allowed for a new sense of personal privacy in American households unknown to earlier generations. Heating, from the hearth to central heating. As we have seen, at the dawn of the 1870 to 1940 era, most heat came from the open hearth of the fireplace, whether in farmhouses or urban dwellings. Though cast iron heaters and kitchen ranges had been invented as early as the 1840s, they were a significant source of heat only beginning in the 1870s and 1880s. However, this central source of heating for the kitchen and main living area did little to heat the bedrooms. Throughout the northern United States, bedrooms were almost as cold as the outside until well into the 20th century, though homeowners carried to bed with them warmed iron ingots or ceramic bed bricks from the kitchen stove. Anecdotes trace the first efforts to install residential central heating systems back to the early 1840s, but an initial obstacle had to be overcome. Steam boilers had a tendency to explode, and Mark Twain in Life on the Mississippi reported, only partly in jest, that people boarding a riverboat in St. Louis had only a 50-50 chance of making it to New Orleans. In the middle of the 19th century, there were four boiler explosions per week, and as late as 1888, there were 246 boiler explosions in a single year. A source reports that for every three explosions, two people were killed. Nevertheless, the first steam systems with room radiators were installed in a few locations in the 1850s and 1860s. Safety problems were gradually solved by the establishment of a standard of low pressures to replace the high pressures that had previously caused the boiler explosions, as well as improvements in pipe design and venting. The widespread use of steam, hot water, and hot air central heating systems began in the 1880s, initially in large homes built for the upper classes. 
This innovation trickled down to middle-class and working-class homes in the half-century after 1880. By 1925, 48% of houses in Zanesville, Ohio, were heated by central furnaces. This is consistent with 58% of urban homes having central heating in 1940, as shown in Table 4-4. That table also shows that central heating was much less common in small towns and on farms. In 1940, only 1% of southern farms had central heating a finding that reflects both the mildness of the southern climate and that very few southern farms had any modern conveniences at all. Of urban homes having central heating, more than three-quarters used coal or coke as fuel, implying that coal had to be delivered and ashes removed, as well as that air pollution was much more common than today, when natural gas dominates as the nation's main fuel for central heating. One side effect of central heating is that it allowed windows to become larger. A Muncie, Indiana building expert estimated that houses built during 1915 to 29 had 50% more glass percent more glass surface than in 1890 because more heat can be secured within. Central heating also contributed to the process by which the cellar turned into an occupied basement. In the late 19th century, cellars were ill-ventilated holes in the ground with stone walls and a floor of dirt used only for storage. But the advent of the central heating boiler or furnace was accompanied to the building out of basement to larger spaces that had cement walls and floors. Conclusion The Transformation of Housing the transition from farm to city during the 1870 to 1940 interval is sometimes portrayed as a shift from open spaces and single-family farmhouses to crowded tenement apartments featuring windowless rooms and limited light entering through fetid, garbage-strewn air shafts. We have seen that this view is simplistic and inaccurate. Most urban dwellings were not tenements but were structures containing one or two dwellings having open air outside and usually a small yard. Farm dwellings in 1870 were not all classic two-story Midwestern farmhouses, but included primitive log cabins, mud huts, and primitive shacks in the South. Urban dwellers in both 1870 and 1940 lived mainly in detached dwellings, and the primitive working-class cottages of the late 19th century were supplemented after 1905 with the modern urban bungalow. These new dwelling types could be purchased for between one and two years' income, and from the beginning incorporated the modern conveniences of electricity connections, running water, at least one indoor bathroom, and central heating. Although these bungalows, most of which remain in today's central city urban landscape, may look crowded together on their narrow lots, they represented a revolutionary leap from primitive to modern housing. An overall change in life after 1870 was a switch, particularly in urban America, from dependence on self-carried water and fuel to dependence on networks. The new networks of telephone lines, water mains, and sewers, and power cables did not just appear suddenly. They were gradually built and expanded from urban cores to areas having less population density. A need was perceived, and a combination of government infrastructure agencies and private capital made meeting it possible. The gradual transition to network connections accompanied two other basic changes in daily life as practiced for millennia. In 1870, the dependence on the open hearth and absence of secondary heating sources made most of the dwelling the same temperature as the outside. The goal of providing an interior year-long temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit occurred in two steps through the gradual diffusion of central heating in the first half of the 20th century and of air conditioning in the second half. Can a value be placed on the transition to the networked house? The answer lies in studies of the relationship between house prices or rents and the presence or absence of particular attributes, such as indoor bathrooms or central heating. The presence of a full bathroom compared to none raises the rent by 82%. The value of central heating compared to the fireplace kitchen 
raises the rent by 28%. There are no separate studies of electricity, for it became universal so rapidly, but its value must have been as large as that of central heating. Multiplying together these improvements implies that the perceived quality of housing units tripled as a result of the introduction of electricity, plumbing, and central heating between 1870 and the early post-war years. The enormous value of the inventions examined in this chapter may be greater than those of any other chapter in part one of this book, with the possible exception of the value of the conquest of infant mortality discussed in chapter seven. The role of individual entrepreneurs in achieving the networked house revolution is quite different than for food and clothing as discussed in the previous chapter, where the long list of familiar entrepreneurial names included food processors, such as Pillsbury and Borden, and marketing innovators included Marshall Field, Roland Macy, Aaron Montgomery Ward, and Richard Sears. Housing, by contrast, lacks big names except in the invention of electric light by Edison and the role of Westinghouse in the development of electric power. Most of the developments that made possible the networked house of urban America in 1929 were achieved by anonymous and decentralized innovations in home appliances, bathroom fixtures, toilets, and furnaces, not to mention the hundreds of municipal officials who approved and financed the evolution of urban sanitation infrastructure. The revolutionary transformation of the American dwelling unit illustrates a major theme of the book. These were inventions that could happen only once. Although the diffusion of the modern conveniences took until 1929 to reach most of urban America and considerably longer to reach small towns and farms, after homes were equipped with these conveniences, the transformation was complete. Continuous economic growth required a continuous stream of new inventions. But consumer electric appliances had mostly been invented by 1940, and it was only a matter of time before most households would be equipped with them. With the exception of air conditioning, no post-1940 invention made anything like the quantum leap of change in everyday life, from physical hauling to flipping switches and turning faucet handles as did the inventions discussed in this chapter. Please subscribe and press the bell icon to never miss another update. Please like, share and comment.